So how it's all connected to spondylitis? Well, let's kind of go back to the roots. So what do we know about spondylitis? Well, majority of patients with spondylitis, more than 95%, they do have HLA B27. And until a couple of years ago, the actual role of B27 was kind of not very well defined. Yes, it's a very important molecule, but what's the link, what's the connection between HLA B27 and spondylitis? There were several theories about that. For example, uh, patients who have HLA B27 positivities, uh, they cannot eliminate microorganisms from the gut, but this theory failed, uh, the only proofs. And then there was a theory about super antigens, meaning that HLA B27 is uh, antigen presenting molecule, and when it's present in your body, so it presents uh, pathogenic peptides in a wrong way, but again, it's a very iffy explanation. So the new theory, and again, it's still a theory, tells you that uh, HLA B27 influences the uh, composition of bodies microflora and microbiota. And uh, that B27 shaped flora actually makes you prone to spondylitis. So there's a large uh, number of publications about that and one of the articles which is available for free uh, in Arthritis Rheumatism was published just a few months ago. So uh, how do we know that this is true? So most of the data came from animals. So what's been shown that uh, you can actually design animals, uh, transgenic mice, with a human HLA B27 molecule inserted in the genome, and these mice do develop spondylitis, right? So some of these mice uh, develop colitis uh, or Crohn's disease. So if you put these mice in germ-free environments, so if you put them in special cages and feed them with basically sterile uh, germ-free meals and sterile water, they never develop spondylitis. So it was the first evidence, and actually it was published on 10 years ago, that microorganisms that do trigger spondylitis. And the second publication came around five or six years ago, so the transgenic rats were designed, and these rats developed colitis and spondylitis very similar to human. And so if you start feeding those uh, animals, transgenic animals with antibiotics at early age, uh, they never develop spondylitis. Again, the gut gets uh, sterilized with antibiotics and it prevents them from developing other disease. Uh, the data regarding humans is very iffy because obviously there are no only germ free humans. It's impractical, right? So, but again, if we compile the data and transfer to human conditions, it makes perfect sense. So, saying that, then, uh, what are the goals then of therapy? So, if you know that you have impaired intestinal permeability and leaky gut, you have abnormal microflora. So how we can fix it, and what are the realistic goals in the therapy of spondylitis? Well, first of all, uh, you need to normalize intestinal permeability, which right now is completely feasible. So second, you can optimize uh, the gut microflora, which is not so feasible, it's very complicated, and uh, it's a, one of the most difficult things to approach. Uh, second, the next one is optimization of toxin removal. It's one of those kind of mysterious conditions, but still, you know, in our practice, we deal with that all the time. So when you have leaky gut syndrome, your body starts dealing with a huge load of products of microbial metabolism, a product of uh, so-called intestinal waste, and so on and so on. And eventually, uh, they can create kind of low toxic stage. And uh, this is, uh, it's been described, you know, there are different lab techniques uh, where you can measure, for example, you can measure the level of ammonia in your blood, and ammonia reflects actually the toxin load in your system. It's a very well described uh, marker. So, uh, and again, uh, it was well described that in patients with active ankylosing spondylitis, ammonia level is up. So, uh, again, one of the goal of therapy is removal of this extra waste and extra toxins. And finally, uh, things which we do feel uh, is inflammation. And again, two goals is reduction of mucosal inflammation and reduction of systemic inflammation. And ideally, we would like to prevent ankylosis or fusion of the joints. And again, these are all theoretical goals. How practical all the stuff we'll talk in a few minutes. So uh, how you can normalize intestinal permeability? Well, we talked about zombie and butyrate. So these are two kind of uh, contracting agents. So uh, can you use butyrate? The answer is yes. So butyrate is commercially available. So it's available for human use. Uh, it's a food supplement and actually we introduced it as a part of our line of products uh, several months ago and we see huge improvement in certain group of patients. 
So uh, butyrate is available as calcium, magnesium salt, and as a sodium salt. It's, uh, it has quite a few other benefits. Uh, so uh, there are vast majority literature on butyrate, which indicates that butyrate prevents colon cancer. It makes perfect sense. It also prevents uh, major inflammatory reactions. Uh, the effect of butyrate is dose dependent. And then the question is whether patients can tolerate high doses, and we still don't know much about that. But in general, uh, this is one of the future and fish products, which uh, probably will be in a radar for the next few years. Uh, L-glutamine, there are quite a few data that uh, simple amino acid L-glutamine uh, can also decrease permeability uh, of uh, the gut, and actually it can make the tight junction more functional and less, less leaky. So, uh, and there are quite a few data, how does it work from a biochemical standpoint. And finally, there is a natural product from uh, extracted from either golden seal or from berry. Fruits is called berberine. And again, uh, berberine traditionally was used as an herbal antibiotic. And over the last 10 years, berberine became very popular in patients with leaky gut syndrome because it works extremely well in combination with butyrate and L-glutamine, and it tightens the tight junction, so it decreases intestinal permeability. So that's what we're interested in our recently, and hopefully we'll have more data in terms of how it works. So some of my patients ask me, can you measure actually leaky gut syndrome? Can you use some tools? And the answer is yes. Uh, the tools are available, they're very expensive, and they're not uh, covered typically by insurance. That's where the problem is. So, but in general, how do you measure, for example, the leakiness? So, by definition, if you have leaky gut syndrome, it means that the gut is permeable for large molecules. So, for example, if you ingest uh, xylose, and xylose is not degradable, large polysaccharide, and if you have normal gut, it doesn't go into your bloodstream and you don't pee it out, right? So, when you have leaky gut, you can detect actually xylose in the urine. And that's the principle of the test. So, if you swallow a small amount of xylose, and in six hours, uh, your urine is tested for that. And so the test is available through kind of custom reference labs. It's expensive test, but it's available. And for those patients who want to do it, I can provide some information on how to get it done. And there are some other labs that they measure permeability for larger molecules. So they're basically a scope of molecules from smaller to larger. And you can define how bad the damage of the tight junction is. So it's a very well-defined actual clinical testing. So, and if you start using uh, these products, you can actually monitor uh, the effect, effectiveness and efficacy, and uh, you can say, well, it's working or it's not working. But again, uh, right now, these are the main products which can decrease intestinal permeability.